speaker today is Rosemary Thornton, a near-death experiencer. Rosemary had an NDE while in hospital. After her husband committed suicide, Rose went into a deep downward spiral. Two years later, Rose was diagnosed with stage two cancer. Rose had an unusually deep NDE while in hospital. The angels told her that if she agreed to return to Earth, she'd be restored to wholeness. Indeed, not only had the disease disappeared, but she was also was healed of the crippling grief occasioned by her husband's suicide. The author of nine books, Rose has been featured on PBS History Detectives, A&E Biography, CBS Sunday Morning News, MSNBC, NPR, BBC Radio, and many more. So please welcome Rosemary Thornton. Well, thank you. Uh, I think Lloyd told the story. I had a great time, went to heaven, talked to the angels, had a healing, and that's it. So thank you very much. <laughs> I believe in brevity. Uh, there's a clock I heard somewhere for me to keep an eye on time. No, don't worry. Oh, oh I see it. I see 11.44. Well, uh, does anyone remember reading April 2016th, Death of City Attorney Stuns Local Officials? Anyone remember reading that? I lost the mic. Anyway, Virginian pilot ran a big article. That was my husband. Came home for lunch. What should I stop? <laughs> there you go. Okay. Yeah, he blessed it. That's the main thing. <laughs> so yes, April 2016. I was married to the man of my dreams. Thought uh, I, we had a lovely life. But he was not living in the light, shall we say? Um, after his death, I learned that there were. Parts of his personality I knew nothing about. I realized I'd been married to a stranger. So the suicide, as a sensitive soul, I mean, I'm a writer. I'm too sensitive to live almost. You know, I'm, I'm that person, and I know y'all can appreciate this. You see a spider in the house, you're like, come here, little spider, let's go outside where you need to live. Um, so the violence, I mean, he used a gun, did it at our home. The violence was unbelievably difficult for me to deal with on a very personal level. And then finding out that he'd had a life about which I knew nothing was very, very difficult, beyond difficult. So thus began the downward spiral. And I left the house. I didn't sleep in the house again uh, after the funeral. And uh, I'd say loved ones uh, didn't know what to do with me. I lost my mind. Because somebody that's sensitive and in love and you can't take but so many burdens. People do break mentally. I guess we used to give people permission to have nervous breakdowns. What do we call it now? Psychotic break? I don't know. But I had whatever one calls such things, and loved ones wanted to put me in a psychiatric ward. And a friend stepped in. His name was Milton. You'll hear a little bit, bit more about Milton. Milton stepped in and said, a psych ward will finish her off. I'll help take care of her. And I, I was not comfortable in the house. I tried staying with different people. It didn't work out. I ended up really the most comfortable in my car. And it was a nice car, it was a Camry. <laughs> Had heated seats, sunroof, lots of features, loved that car. And it was comfortable, it was kind of cocoonish. You know, it was a comfortable place, it was familiar, and it was detached from the memories. Walking around the home I had shared with this man was excruciating, couldn't do it. So Milton would, <laughs> it's kind of funny now, I would pull in the driveway of the house, and I had a dog. Milton was house-sitting the house and, house and taking care of the dog. I'd pull in the driveway once a day, and Milton would come out with some food. And, uh, and it was mainly Gatorade, and he was buying me like those Insure things you drink. Because that's all I, I could only drink like half of one. And then he'd bring me fresh clothes, and I'd take off again. And I'd go find a safe place to park. I just couldn't be in the house. I couldn't be in anyone's house. I couldn't be in a house. And then another friend stepped forward, her name was Tracy, and she said, uh, you're, gonna, you're starting a downhill slide, you can't live out of your car. And so Tracy said, come live with me. And I said, no. And she said, try it for one night. And I said, I'll do it for one night. And that turned into four months of me. I would only commit to one night at a time because the idea of making any decisions were just unbearable. But one night at a time I thought I could do it and I did. So after four months, four plus months, uh, I rented a little house. Actually, it was six months out because there was a lot of time I just wandered in the beginning, the early days. 
So in October 2016, six months after he did this, I rented a very modest little house in Portsmouth and Milton and the dog came with me. So my dog and I were reunited, which was very important because the dog, he did this in front of my dog. And the dog, it turns out, after my husband shot himself, the dog had tried to lick him back to life. And they had to pull her off of him. Because she's a little dog. She's had a sweet life. She was eight, uh, she was uh, six years old at the time. She didn't know what happened. So we, my neighbor, very good neighbors, my da the, the cops come, Norfolk cops come, and they you know, get the noose to drag the dog off like she hasn't been through enough. But my neighbors intervened, they took the dog aside and they had to cut stuff out of her fur because she'd been trying to help him after he did this thing. So Milton and Teddy and I, Teddy's the dog, Milton and Teddy and I were reunited at this little rental house and Milton lived in one of the three bedrooms, a great house, three bedrooms, two baths, served our needs very, very well. I dealt with tremendous nightmares, unbelievable nightmares, everything from demons coming after me to my husband coming back from the dead. To me, the, the, the prevalent nightmare was I was back at the old house and I'm running around, I, I'm approaching the house and, and trying to get in the house and I know he's going to do this thing and I can never get to him in time and I see him shoot himself every night over and over and over again. I relive this and it got to where I, I hated sleep. I hated being awake and I hated being asleep. There was no happy place. So Milton would sit by my bedside and read to me at night. He'd read me the 91st Psalm, the 23rd Psalm, the Beatitudes. He read just, it was a way that I could find peace. And he would, this was very dear. By the way, we'll talk about this more in just a second. He was an atheist. He was a hardcore, devout, militant atheist. And he used to get a magazine called Atheist Monthly. And he'd, he'd hold it up and show it to me. And he'd say, they got some really good articles. They're very intelligent. A lot of intellectuals are atheists, you know. And I'd say, Look, I'm, I'm not reading your magazine, but thanks anyway. And I, like, he'd go to Taco Bell and he'd order his favorite food and the price always came to $6.66. <laughs> and he'd say, it's really good food and there's a sign here. And I'd say, I don't want to hear about that. And actually, as you know, things progress, he softened on that because he was reading me the Bible every night and he was seeing the effects of the prayers. I was getting better. Oh, that's a dog. I thought somebody was giving me a sign. Maybe somebody is. And then in October 2016, shortly after I'd moved into this house with Milton, and we, were do we would hold hands at night. I did put this man through a lot. At night, I'd make him come tuck me in the bed, you know, because I was still dealing with um, a terror that my husband might come back from the dead or he'd haunt me or, you know, God knows what was going to happen next. It's trauma messes you up. And uh, it's like a nuclear detonation in your head. And I, like it more t I liken it more to a uh, stroke. I felt more like a stroke victim. I, I used to have an expansive, impressive vocabulary. I've been a writer for 30 years, and suddenly I couldn't remember words. I could hardly form sentences. I lost the ability to read, which is why I had him read to me. I could read the words, but it was just like a jumble of words. And somebody took a whole bunch of words out of the dictionary and threw them against the wall, and I'm like, well, there's a bunch of words, but I don't know what they mean. I know what shoe means, and wall means, and white, and black, but I, what, what are they trying to put together? So it was very difficult for me as a lifelong reader, learner, and researcher, writer, to lose the thing I loved, one of the things which was reading. So I did put Milton through a lot. I'd make him hold my hand at night when he was standing by my bed and we would say a prayer, a prayer of protection, that the angels would stand guard over the house, stand guard over me, protect my thoughts. And then he would sleep in the adjoining room and he, he was like a mother to me in many ways. If I stirred, if I rolled over in bed, no matter what I did, he'd jump out of his bed and run in the room and he'd say, are you okay? And I started, I developed this habit of night eating, which was actually a blessing because I'd lost a lot, a lot, a lot of weight. And I'd get up apparently in the middle of the night and walk right past his door down to the kitchen and I ate vanilla, weight, uh, what is it, Vienna fingers in my sleep. I love me some Vienna fingers. And, and I, the thing is, I'd get up the next morning, I'm like, why is there Vienna finger crumbs all over the bed? And then they were in my teeth. You know, I was like, what, what is that? And I was like, ah, oh. and he said, you run in the kitchen. I followed you and you ate a bunch of Vienna fingers and you went back to bed which it turned out to be a blessing. So then my life was going pretty well and I bought a house in, um, a little bit later and I asked Milton, I said, I'm okay now, you can move out. Uh, you, know, you can go live on your own. He bought a home of his own. And I thought I was, I was doing okay. And then September 2018, which now we're two and a half years out, I developed some uh, alarming symptoms and I went to a doctor and a couple of doctors and the short version is they diagnosed me with stage two cervical cancer. And I just railed at everything. I thought, God, how could you do this to me? I have been, 
I had been praying for my husband. Uh, we were married 10 years. I, I had a habit, developed a very faithful habit of praying for him three times a day. I prayed for protection. I prayed for good health. I prayed for a, a joyous marriage. One of the epiphanies of my life, there's a story that Martin Luther, who had been in a not so happy marriage, I think his wife's name was Anna. Is that right? Anne? And uh, he said he had his epiphany about being miserable in this marriage when he said the purpose of marriage is not to make us happy, it's to make us holy. And I thought, you know, that works with this guy. I, I, I can work on being holy. So I devoted myself to praying for my husband. By my math, he pulled the trigger on that Glock about the time I was praying for him that day. Uh, I was not there at the time. So this was very difficult in my life as a Christian. It was excruciating. So, so now t September 2018, two and a half years after my husband killed himself, I'm thinking, how in the world does it, what's the next horrible thing that's going to happen? You know, do we have any more in line for Rosemary? I was very angry. Boy, oh boy, was I angry. And I kind of I had a break again. I went back to bed. I couldn't leave bed. I, you know, and then, and then came September 5th, 2018, when I was scheduled for a cervical biopsy. Now, at this point, I'd had, uh, I guess, two, I'd had two minor biopsies and two s examinations, one by a gynecological oncologist, which determined the flesh was actually distorted from the disease. So there's no doubt what's going on. So September 5th, 2018, I had been a Christian scientist for most of my life, and I hadn't done doctors. In fact, when they do the pre-surgery interview, they said, Mrs. Thornton, your file's pretty thin. And I said, well, I don't do doctors. I've spent a lifetime leaning on God and relying on prayer, and I don't do doctors, I don't do medicine. So uh, I told them, go easy on me, I'm a drug virgin, and they didn't. But after the surgery, it took three hours to wake me up. It was a 20-minute procedure. It took three hours to awaken me. They got me up. They get me off the gurney. They send me off to the potty because, you know, they want you out, 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 out. Go. We need this bed for somebody else. Go. Out you go. Off with you. And uh, as I did that, I realized I was bleeding profusely. I told the RN three times, something's gone bad or wrong. And three times she said, once you get home, you'll feel fine. So they sent me home bleeding profusely with undiagnosed, well, who knows where it was coming from, uterine or cervical heavy, heavy bleeding. So I got home, and by the time I got home, I'd ruined, uh, actually, it's Milton's uh, sister, Mabel, drove me home. I, we had me stacked on pads, you know, those hospital pads, and I'd messed up the car. I'd bled through everything. And at home, I, I, I you know, because I, I had this lovely home with lovely, very, very, very light beige carpet. And when you know you're bleeding to death, the last thing you want to do is mess up the carpet. <laughs> so I was very concerned about the carpet. So I went and stood in my bathroom. I had a, a large walk-in, a white tiled shower. I do like white. So I stood in that white tiled shower and I just watched the blood going down the drain. And you know, I back up briefly, I had been asking God three prayers prior to this. And, and I, these were pretty sincere prayers. One, I asked God, either heal me or let me die in my sleep. I can't go on like this. This is too much pain for one human being. Too much trauma, too much pain. I'm not up to it, let me go. So either let me die or heal me. Let me die in my sleep or heal me. The second prayer was, when I go, when it's my time, I beg of you, spare me the life of you. I've been through this horror show once. I don't want to see this again. I don't want to see the thing that was in my dreams of me trying to catch him. Stop him. Please don't do this. And then the third was, I can't handle any more decisions. I can't. I had severe decision fatigue. I couldn't face it from being foreclosed on by Bank of America for a house that was current because the primary lien holder was dead to all, he, he left some messes behind. I had to go lawyer after lawyer after lawyer after lawyer to clean up a legal nightmare he left, nightmares he left me. But I couldn't handle any more decisions. So those were three important prayers that I prayed every day. So September 5th, 2018, I'm at my house, I'm in that shower, leaning against the wall, didn't even have the water on, I just wanted a place where I wasn't going to mess up the house. Aren't we well-behaved women? <laughs> <laughs> Never make a mess that you can't clean up yourself, even if you're going to die soon. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of messed up. <laughs> so, I saw the blood just coming out of me, and I, I kind of leaned against the white tiled wall in that nice walk-in shower, and I said, you know, if you want to die, just sit down. It's not going to be long. You're going to pass out. Because I knew when you die from, ex I don't know why I knew this, when you die from exsanguination, the legal or the medical term, you lose consciousness and then you go. And I was already feeling pretty wobbly. So I looked at this and I thought, oh, I don't know. 
I just bought a house and just bought a car and uh, I don't know. So I, I also thought, poor Milton, he's been through so much, you know. So I kind of, you know, got myself sturdied up again and I went out to the living room and wrapped myself up with a, several towels because again, even if I'm leaving this house for the last time, I want it tidy. <laughs> um, and I went out to the living room and I told Milton, actually I stood in the foyer which did not have tile floor. I'm like, I'm not messing up that car. That's a nightmare to clean. That's a housekeeping nightmare messing up that carpet. So I stood on a clean, non-permeable surface and told Milton, call 911, I'm, I'm dying. So we did, the ambulance came, and they didn't take it seriously. They, they took me to the hospital, they took me to a standalone ER, which meant there was not a hospital connected to this ER, it was kind of a glorified urgent care. So they, they didn't even run lights and siren, and they took their sweet time putting in IVs, oh, Mrs. Thornton, you're fine, everything's fine, everything's fine, fine, fine. And then, you know, so we stop at the stoplights. I'm like, are you kidding me? Are you free? And I wanted to just get up and say, listen, buddy, I think my, my time is limited here. Let's, you know, let's hit the gas, you know? You ever been with that driver that somebody's driving you somewhere and they're going so slow because they're going slower and slower because they're still talking? I'm like, come on, buddy, speed it up. But it wasn't, you know, I, I couldn't talk to anybody. I'm back there and, you know, they've got stuff going. And, and the thing is the ambulance driver or the, the attendant in the back with me, EMT, said, oh, you're doing just fine. I'm like, no, I'm not. I've already lost two, three pints, you know? So they take me to this little standalone ER. The little standalone ER had a doctor that was quite young. And the thing is, when she looked in my eyes, I mean, she, she did an exam, and then she looked in my eyes, and I saw fear. And that did not reassure me. Because, <laughs> and what probably should have happened, you know, coulda, woulda, shoulda, they probably should have said, whoa, this is, a, this is a severe bleed from an undetermined source, get her to a real hospital now. That's what should have. But then they got what should have happened. The, as I said, uh, I think the title of the, yesterday's talk was Remembering the Light, How Dying Saved My Life. So how, how can you say it shouldn't have happened? So anyway, uh, talk about burying the lead there. But so, um, so then they gave me uh, Dilaudid. Even though I'm losing great quantities of blood, after the exam they say, well, you're just, you know, we're just gonna put some gauze in you and you're gonna be fine. They packed me with gauze. And then they, they gave me some Dilaudid, which is a morphine derivative, and by the way, contraindicated for plunging blood pressure, kind of like the worst thing you can do. Not to mention, I'm already down a couple pints, maybe more. So yeah, they gave me the Dilaudid, and what long after that Dilaudid, and now I'm stretched out flat on the gurney, you know, and Milton, trusted, worthy Milton's by my side. And uh, that once that Dilaudid hit, I don't think I was there 30 seconds, maybe a minute, and I was gone. And by gone, I mean unconscious. So I am unconscious, and Milton, again, it's great to have a witness to your life. He had been a next door neighbor, you know? Milton had been a buddy, a ham radio buddy, next door neighbor, who had had the unfortunate uh, uh, position of being the one to discover my dead husband's body. Which, by the way, you ever see a body, just walk away. They held him for five hours for questioning, wouldn't even let him get up to go to the bathroom, made him sit in a chair in the front yard, in the front yard, where all the looky loos and crowds gathering. Made him sit in the front yard for five hours. He said, what if I need to go to the bathroom? And the cop said, then you go there. You're not leaving. Five hours for the guy who discovered my husband after he did this. So Milton's already been through, not to mention take care of me for two and a half years. So Milton said he's watching, you know, the, the medical staff at this little standalone in the ER put a um, blood pressure cuff on me and they put a pole socks on my finger and walk out of the cubicle, walk out of the room. It had a door on it. Walk out of the room, leave Milton there. Milton says he's looking at my blood pressure and it's going doop, 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 going on down. And then he said, at one point, uh, my blood pressure hit 32 over 25, which is real low, it turns out. <laughs> and I tried to sit up on, the, he said, your eyes just popped open. And he said, you tried to sit up on the gurney, which is pretty impressive for somebody with a blood pressure of 32 over 25 who just had a, you know, a triple scoop of, of uh, Dilaudid, you know. So he said, I tried to sit up on the gurney. I, I got, you know, upper part of my body up. I reached up to heaven, looked up, talked to somebody only I could see, and then dropped back down, and the blood pressure cuff went to error. In other words, I think, I'm pretty sure that's when I left for heaven. And so he stands up like, ruh you know, like, this is not looking good. And as he's standing, the alarm on the blood pressure monitor thing is going off, and the nurse comes running down the hallway, and this is almost funny, kind of, sort of, now. The, uh, the nurse comes in, the RN comes in, and she fiddles with the cuff. She's like, well, something must have gone wrong. It's not working. It says error. 
she fiddles with the cuff for a bit and then she fiddles with the plug and she's playing with it and like you know what is it Occam's razor the simplest solution is the right solution maybe that person doesn't have blood pressure maybe that's the reason that says error but Milton said after, after he said it was about 90 seconds at which point um, she took her sinewy knuckles and did a sternum rub uh, which is apparently what they do to somebody they think is dead, maybe, sort of, possibly, or unconscious. And he said you were completely unresponsive. And he said, by this time, when he looked at me, I was literally white as a sheet. He said, you hear that expression, but you don't, you've never really seen flesh white as a sheet. And he said, my lips had turned cyanotic, and under my eyes were blue. And then, he, as he so delicately said later, um, I've seen corpses that look better than that, which I guess I was kind of a corpse at that point. So um, that's when the nurse, you know, kind of hits the alarm bells. We're at about two minutes now when she finally gets the doctor in the room because they had to summon the doctor from somewhere else in the ER. So we, they get the doctor in the room and then the doctor shoes Milton out into the hallway. So, and this is what originally my talk here was going to be about is Milton, this avowed atheist, this man who spent two and a half years taking care of me, reading me the Bible, talking to me about God, which he would always say, well, you know, I don't believe in God, but... So, so he's ushered out into the hallway. And I said, wow, you must have been just crazed with fear and panic. You know, this person you've been shown such tender ministrations and care and love to just died. You know, what a bookend. You see her, you find her husband, and then two and a half years after your best energies and efforts and love and care, she dies. What a, what a crappy pair of bookends for a man's life, you know? And he goes, and, and this was, by the way, after I come back, after I'm out of the hospital is when we had this conversation about you must have been terrified. And he kind of, he's sitting in a chair in my den at my house, and he kind of, you know, well, not really. I said, what? He said, well, when I was out in that hallway, uh, you know, just leaning against the wall, waiting for them to tell me something, he said, an angel came to me and said, don't worry, we just need her for a few minutes, she'll be right back. <clears throat> Yeah, that changed him in a big way. And he said, I said, do go on. <laughs> Tell me more. And he said, well, you know, it was something spoke. I said, did you see something? Or he said, no, it was more like a feeling and a voice. Just a, a message, really, a message. And I said, so what did you do? And he said, well, I went, and went to the lobby and got a soda. And I said, what? I wasn't there for a strep throat test. We weren't waiting for results to, you know, my tonsillitis. I died. I bled to death and died. He said, well, the angel was pretty clear that you'd be back. So and he said, I was thirsty. It'd been a long day. So he did. He went to the lobby, got a drink, had a soda, waited a while, came back to the hallway. And while he's in the hallway, and, and by the way, he, had, he said the thing about it was he had perfect peace. It wasn't like, well, I'm 99% sure the angels are right. It was just, yeah, of course. Well, duh, she's coming back. But that's, <laughs> he was completely unmoved by it. So then, while he's outside of the doorway, in the hallway, still waiting, waited a long time, by the way, they open the door to the cubicle. Four times this happens. They open the door to the cubicle, and by the way, he said they summoned everybody from that ER. Even the receptionist was called in to work on me. But they open the door to the cubicle, and you know, he's still out in the hallway, and somebody emerges from the room with an arm full of linens literally dripping in blood, soaked in blood, four times. And I think what happened, and nobody's talking, but I suspect what happened is that gauze acted like a cork. So I kept bleeding and bleeding and bleeding, and they didn't know. But yeah, four times they come out. He said they ran out of biohazard bags. They ran out of places to put it. They ran out of their scrubs. I mean, he said it was a mess. And he also said, you, you know you're probably already down two or three pints when we got you there. So you lost a lot, a lot, a lot of blood. So I said, okay, so when you saw those, you know, linens, come out, was, was that upsetting? He said, well, no, no. He said, the angel said you'd be back. <laughs> and I did ask him after this, I said, so, and by the way, it was Milton and his sister Mabel, who's also very dear, were sitting in my den in this conversation just a handful of days after, actually it was a day after I was out of the hospital and back home. So it's Mabel in one chair, Milton in the other chair, and I'm kind of you know, lounging on the couch, and he's telling us all this. And I said, so, Milton, what did that do to your belief system? Do tell. Because <laughs> he always believed when, it, when you die, it's lights out the end. You know, that we're, we're just these mortals living here for a brief span when you die the end. 
And he said, well, it shattered every single thing I've ever cherished and believed. I'm like, well, oh, good answer. And I said, so you believe that life goes on? He goes, well, yeah, I do. And I said, you believe in angels? And he goes, yeah, I believe in angels. And how about God? He goes, yes, yes, yes. I know, I know, I know. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and they really, there, there's so many lovely facets to this. But one of them is Mabel, his sister, started to cry. And I looked at her, and it was very touching. And she said, through tears, she said, brother, I've been praying for you for 30 years that you would know about God. And I thought, wow. And Milton, you know, Milton is not given to tears, so Milton was like, Ooh. <laughs> Typical 65-year-old, you know, funny, funny guy. So, <clears throat> uh, so meanwhile, I'm having the time of my life, frankly. I don't know exactly if it was when I reached up, I died, but I suspect it was. That's pretty cool. I, I've always believed that the soul... I, I believe it's God's mercy that the soul pops out before the body, you know, has the last heartbeat, last breath of air. So um, I popped out of that body like toast out of a toaster. Absolutely like toast. It was great. It was like a catapult out of that body. I was like, whoa! I was unconscious when I died and I woke up when I passed. I woke up with a start, literally just being flung through the air. It was like a, it was like a pop or a boing or a ping. It was very, very, very dramatic. And I'm floating through the blackness, the womb of creation, great term, and I was very much enjoying it. Encountered a massive spiritual being behind me, slightly behind me, and up to my left, and I said, and now it's a party because there's somebody with me. I'm not alone. And this blackness, by the way, was very comfortable and comforting and enveloping and the peace. People talk about the love, but as a highly anxious person, I've always struggled with peace. The peace. I thought about the Bible verse, the peace that passeth all, under, uh, the peace that passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And I thought, this is what Paul's talking about, this peace. So the spiritual being's now with me in this, and I turned with a lilt in my voice, because, hey, I'm having a great time. And I said, and who are you? <laughs> and the answer was, you. You are the image and likeness. I'm the original. And I thought, whoa, that's pretty, that would have been good to know back there, but that's awesome, and I do mean awe-inspiring great. But in several people's, oh, you wanted to come back, you weren't ready. Nope, 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 I know for many reasons. One, I was ready. I, I really felt like I'd been granted early release for good behavior. I really did. I was like, I'm out at 59 years and change. It's over, I'm done. It was a fairly peaceful passing. You know, not my best day, but it had a good ending. And I'm, I'm done, and not to mention, I mean, I knew I had watched myself bleed for, I don't know, an hour and a half. And I thought, what, am I, what in the world am I gonna go back to? You know, I'm now, I, I knew that that did not look good how it ended. It really didn't. So I was very grateful to be, uh, and the, I was going home. I mean, that was a prevalent feeling. I am going home, I'm going home, I'm going home. And it was so powerful. And then ultimately I was taken, and see if he told me I was, I was dead for more than 10 minutes, and they couldn't even do CPR because you can't do CPR on somebody when they run out of blood. So for 10 minutes I had no oxygen to the brain, no blood to the brain. So it's kind of amazing. A 59 year old woman comes back from a, a bleed out that severe. So I ended up in a, a white room and, and instead of floating I was on my feet and it was a big room and there was a door on the far end of it. And I was like, hey, I've read, been reading about NDEs my whole life. I know what that door is. Out of my way, I'm doing the door. Don't need to ask me twice. So I, I, and I thought, I don't know if I have feet or legs, I don't know what's going on. But I perambulated toward the door with intention, and I was at the door, and I paused, and I paused, and I said, is this the divine will for my life? And the answer was, no, but, I'm, I'm on the but, <laughs> what? And the answer was, no, but, whatever you decide. If you decide to go back, you decide to go forward. You go with all of God's love and mercy and grace and peace and care. And I thought, I'll take it. I'm going forward. I am done. I am done with this earth life. It has been a hard life. It's been a hard two and a half years. I am done and done. So then as I'm lifting up my right hand to, go through, to push through the door, and I think, oh, that's interesting. I'm right-handed in heaven. I'm right-handed on earth, right-handed in heaven. I thought, how cool is that? But I, I lift my right hand. And then I have an image of that RN who had been at my bedside when I was on that gurney in the ER. And in this image, that RN 
from whom I had extracted a promise that she wasn't going to let me die. When I said, please don't let me, you know, before I lost consciousness, I said, Gra promise me you're not going to let me die. And she said, oh, honey, we're not going to let you die. We have many solutions for this. Well, an image is I'm at that door in the white room ready to move on through. An image of that nurse comes to me, and I have a vision of her sitting on a stool in like a hospital storeroom, and she's uh, holding her head in her hands, leaning forward and sobbing. And through her tears, she's saying, I promised that woman I wasn't going to let her die, and I lost her. And I'm like, oh, man, <laughs> that's real bad. <laughs> And I think, ah, crap. And then I think, well, you know what? Life's full of hardships. You'll get over it. And then, <laughs> kind of, I did think that. And then it gets worse. And then I felt her pain somewhere here, which kind of annoyed me because I'm like, I don't have it here. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm dead. And that's when it really hit me. I felt her pain. I felt that agonal grief that I had known for two and a half stinking years. And I took, a, I, I don't know, I just, I just kind of took a pause and I put my right hand at my side and I said, if I die, it's going to ruin that nurse's day. And like that, I was back on that gurney. And as Ellen and I have discussed, I was ticked off. I was like, Robert's rules of order, point of order. We have a first, a second, and a discussion phase. I'm not here in any discussion. But I was back in that body in, a, in less than a second. And the nurse is in my face now. Lots of people in the room. Boy, it's a lot of people in that little room. Nurse is in my face and she says, I mean lovingly, she looks at me and she goes, what is your name? Rosemary. What year is it? 2018. Where are you? A crummy excuse for an ER. So <laughs> that was my response. And that's when she goes, I'll have you know this is an accredited facility. So, but after 10 minutes with no blood pressure, no heartbeat, there was an expectation. They didn't know what they had gotten a heartbeat on, you know? They didn't know what was happening. And I've since learned that there's something called, it's called DIC, but it's a medical, medical phenomenon that once somebody bleeds out their blood vessels and arteries and all the stuff collapses, and getting that stuff refilled is very difficult. And I talked with an ER nurse and they had a, a young man that died from bleeding to death. I think he was 24. He bled to death. They got him back, and he died again 36 hours later. And when I did go to the hospital, I mean, they then, boy, then the ambulance ride was a lot of fun. Before this dying event, they had been like, oh, we can't find a hospital. We can't find a room. A lot of politics. Where are we going to put her? Where are we going to put her? After I came back from dead, they had a gurney and an ambulance waiting. They slung me on that gurney like I was a slab of meat, and they said, take her, run. And I know they thought I was going to die again. They didn't want me to die again on them. And the ambulance drivers were very concerned. I mean, the guy kept talking to me and talking and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, just shut up for a minute, please. I didn't say that, but I thought that. So, and then I went back to the hospital. In the hospital for five days, profound experience. I'd always been very frightened of hospitals. And I since learned that divine love is as omnipresent and omnipotent in hospitals as it is anywhere else. And in the hospitals, the angels sang these songs. And people talk about being 50% in this world, 50% into that. I was 95% in the other world. But the angels sang me these beautiful songs. And I said, I'm good with houses, not so much with music. I'll never remember the melody. And they said, this is for your healing. This is not for you to write. It's not for you to write down and share. It's for you. So my time in the hospital was incredibly profound. And as a consequence, I mean, I was out of the hospital in five days, and they did say I'd had a heart attack and my heart had stopped from lack of blood. So they medically verified that that's indeed what happened. And uh, it, was, it was quite something, but they believed I had significant damage to my heart because my enzymes were way up when I went in the hospital. And they said, so you've suffered significant heart damage, and they did a million, t and so the whole time they're telling me all this ominous, unpleasant prediction, I said, well, the angels said if I agreed to come back, I'd be fine, <laughs> which is true. The angels said the white room was about healing. It was about purifying. It was about removing the sins of my husband, the sins of my own, the sins of the world. The word they used was muck. We're taking the muck of the earth off of you. You're being cleaned again. As Milton, my buddy who's an IT, says, it's, it's, you, got re you went back to the Creator and got rebooted. <laughs> And so it took some time, and I had to find another doctor. But ultimately, uh, it was uh, proven with lots of tests 
There was no damage to my heart. There was no damage to anything. I'm in excellent health. And that cancer that had distorted the flesh was 100% gone. In fact, the second, the surgeon who did the final series of biopsies said, your skin is so pink and pretty and perfect. I don't think there ever was cancer. So it wasn't like, oh yeah, it's looking better. She said, I, I don't believe it. And I mean, I had, I guess, three biopsies and also a visual exam. So I mean, there's little doubt as to what happened. And Milton again waiting for me in the waiting room after this second biopsy two months later. And, and they biopsied it a lot of different things, a lot of different ways. But he said the surgeon ran out into the waiting room, an attractive young, or an attractive woman, pretty woman, threw her arms around Milton's neck while he's waiting for the outcome of this final biopsy and says, she's right, it's all gone. So the angels had promised if I agreed to come back, I'd be healed in heaven. Little miffed about the glasses thing, you know, everything else was healed, why not deal with this, you know? But as, as Dick has shared with me, maybe, uh, and he and I have talked about this, maybe it's the thorn in the flesh, don't know, but I'm very grateful to have come back from that experience, so. Did I do it in time? I did it close to time. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>